Stars, and welcome back to another episode of Generation Films. My name is American Ben. If everything you know about nuclear power you learned from The Simpsons, you've come to the right video. But first, listen. I'm not sure how many more videos on nuclear science and history we can do, because YouTube wasn't a huge fan of our last video on the subject. Even though it was very well received by you and all of your comments and engagement on the subject were very insightful and mature. That said, I feel like we have to try just one more video on this subject anyway. Today's topic, what movies get wrong about nuclear fallout. With the proliferation of nuclear weapons in the mid-19th century, people's fears of global ground wars faded, and fears of nuclear catastrophe due to this nascent, unknown power source rose rapidly. And of course, what good is Hollywood if not to play on those fears? After all, what are movies but our dreams and nightmares come to life? The 1954 film The Atomic Kid, directed by Leslie H. Martinson, and released not two years after the first test of a thermonuclear weapon in the Marshall Islands... Don't touch him, he's radioactive. Is he human? I'm afraid he is. ...tells the story of a man who, after being exposed to radiation from a nuclear test in the desert, gains superpowers. Now, I shouldn't have to tell you this, but radiation exposure, as far as we know, cannot give you superpowers. His problem is more in the field of nuclear physics. He radiated like pure U-235. Oh, sure. Is that good? It certainly didn't give my pet gerbil any when I confused it for pizza and put it in the microwave at a very young and impressionable seven years old. But while no pizza was made that day, new scientific breakthroughs were, along with delicious burgers courtesy of my little ace. Anyway, so what does happen when people are exposed to nuclear fallout or radioactive materials in the atmosphere? Well, first, it depends on the level of radiation that one is exposed to. The 1959 film On the Beach tells the story of a post-nuclear fallout world. We're all doomed, you know. The whole silly, drunken, pathetic lot of us. A world in which the last remaining human inhabitants are desperately seeking to escape the clutches of the nuclear fallout that is quickly traveling through the air from country to country. But can dangerous nuclear fallout actually travel that far? Well, when the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in Ukraine suffered a meltdown in 1986, the incident directly contaminated about 62,000 square miles of land, and increased levels of radiation were noted all across northern Europe, thousands of miles away. Some 50 or so people total died from the Chernobyl disaster, whether directly or indirectly from nuclear fallout. In general, it's hard to predict the levels of radioactive fallout from a nuclear explosion, because it varies based on a variety of factors, including the yield and design of the weapon, the height of the explosion, the nature of the surface beneath the point of the blast, and the speed and direction of the wind. But let me take a step back to better explain where I'm going with this. Nuclear fallout is a complex mixture of fission products, or radioisotopes, created by splitting atoms. Many of these fission products decay rapidly and emit gamma radiation an invisible but highly energetic form of light. Exposure to too much of this radiation in a short time can damage the body's cells and its ability to fix itself. This is how we get radiation sickness. But radiation levels fall off exponentially after nuclear blasts as hot radioisotopes decay into stable atoms, which shrinks the dangerous fallout zone. Furthermore, the dangerous material in nuclear fallout are radioactive isotopes the biggest threat of which are the short-lived radionuclides that exist really only in the vicinity of the blast itself due to shorter half-lives. One of those radioactive isotopes is iodine-131, which has an extremely short half-life of only eight days, meaning every eight days the material decreases by half. Thus, iodine-131 doesn't remain very effective for long. That said, cesium-137 is another radioactive isotope of nuclear fallout, and it has a half-life of 30 years, and as such, lasts for much longer. But as radioactive fallout travels, it's no longer as concentrated as it spreads out and becomes diluted. Thus, it's less hazardous to human beings. So then what if you are in the dangerous fallout zone and are exposed to enough radiation to cause radiation sickness? Touch him. 
He's hot. Well, one thing that radiation does not do is turn affected people into demonic bloodthirsty mutants. <laughs> the main symptoms were loss of hair, bleeding into the skin, hemorrhagic manifestations, lesions in the mouth and throat, vomiting, diarrhea, and fever. Exposure to nuclear fallout can also cause birth defects but really only if a woman is pregnant at the time of the blast. In the early stages of pregnancy, a fetus exposed to radiation is at a risk for severe brain damage and even death. And according to a study done at the University of Oslo, in the case of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the researchers were not able to demonstrate genetic effects in children born to parents one or both of whom were exposed to bomb radiation. In other words, as of yet, studies have not been able to demonstrate that children who aren't yet conceived at the time of a nuclear blast bear a discernible risk of inheriting the effects suffered by their parents. All of these myths, and yet we still get radioactive, giant, mutated ants in films. A lot of myths about nuclear fallout actually surround the radiation that results as a consequence of a nuclear reactor meltdown. The 1979 film The China Syndrome highlighted the dangers of nuclear power, a new but rapidly developing technology at the time. Oh my god, kid. Is that pump? Like isolation valve, main three water valve. Yeah. But are nuclear reactors actually dangerous? To be clear, it takes about 10,000 millisieverts or about 1,000 rem, both units for the measurement of radiation dosage, to kill someone with a single dose of radiation within weeks. Okay, so first off, according to the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission, someone living within a 50 mile radius of a nuclear power plant would receive an additional radiation dose of 0.01 millirems per year. A chest x-ray produces about 1,000 times that amount in an instant. What about the radiation effects from all this material? We've all seen the poor guy suffering the effects of sunburn. Well, radiation's like that. So the reactors themselves, sans any sort of accident, are not dangerous to surrounding populations. So that begs the question, what about accidents? Just weeks after the release of the China Syndrome, a nuclear power plant in Three Mile Island, Pennsylvania, released radioactivity into the air. This sent the local inhabitants rushing to evacuate and the larger country into a frenzy. Okay, we're off the line. Disconnected from the grid. Ted, stabilize the reactor. Right. But the truth is that the people living in the area were exposed to an average of 6.5 millirems of radiation. Again, less than a chest x-ray and just a bit more than is absorbed by a person on a cross-country flight from New York City to Los Angeles. Actually, the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission estimates that the average American absorbs 620 millirem of radiation a year. About half of that yearly dose comes from natural background radiation constantly present in the environment and raining on us from outer space. Thank God, we're losing it. It's a back pressure. Now, what the hell happened to the high-pressure coolant injection? Hipsy's valve dealt for maintenance, Jack. But what about Chernobyl, American Ben? There has been a nuclear accident in the Soviet Union, and the Soviets have admitted that it happened. The Soviet version is this. One of the atomic reactors at the Chernobyl atomic power plant near the city of Kiev was damaged, and there is speculation in Moscow that people were injured and may have died. Well, there are a few aspects of the Chernobyl graphite moderated reactor that differentiated it from the light water reactors used in the U.S. and that combined to cause a major disaster at the site in 1986. The major safety feature commonly found in nuclear power reactors that was missing in the design of the Chernobyl reactor was a containment structure. The containment structure involves the reactor being contained inside a casing that acts as a radioactive shield. Most reactor designs in the U.S. include a thick steel-reinforced concrete shell that, in the case of a disaster or accident, will prevent radioactive materials from releasing and spreading. Without the protection of a containment structure at Chernobyl, radioactive material escaped into the environment and the Chernobyl accident became the disaster that it was. Despite the well-received concerns of Hollywood, nuclear reactors are quite safe. I hate people talking about me that way. Karen, the company's got to blame somebody, otherwise it's their fault. Okay, radioactive bores could be a problem, but aside from that, we're all good. 
Anyway, that's the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please like, comment, and subscribe down below. I hope we can do more of these videos, but I'm not sure that we are going to be able to do them in the future. We'll just have to wait and see how this one goes. For now, I'll catch you next time. Generation Films, peace.